Yes, it's a very warm good a very warm good morning to everybody. Uh, my name is Anuj, and from the entire family of Dabar India Limited, I welcome uh, everyone for this webinar. Uh, apologies for a technical glitch uh, because of which there's a couple of minutes of delay. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we have uh, another interesting webinar today, and uh, Dr. Kohli again has uh, spared his valuable time to throw some important light on a very very important topic. Although the topic might not uh, seem very uh, important uh, to a common man, but uh, suddenly from a medical standpoint, if you look at uh, hypothyroidism, is a very very important uh, kind of a precursor to many of the diseases. And uh, in the subsequent uh, slides, Dr. Kohli will also show us highlight as to how hypothyroidism plays a very very critical role in the holistic you know well being of a particular uh, person. And uh, not only from allopathy standpoint, but also from Ay Ayurveda standpoint, we will also look at how do we manage such a challenging condition. And uh, Dr. Kohli has been uh, an avid practitioner of the holistic medicine, a uh, uh, cardiac surgeon by profession, uh, by conducting more than over 8,000 cardiac operations within India and overseas at the University Hospital Uppsala in Sweden. Uh, he has set up various heart institute in India, Escorts Heart Institute, New Delhi, Batra Hospital, Hero, DMJ Heart Institute, and Sri Balaji Action Medical Institute in New Delhi. And uh, Dr. Kohli is an avid practitioner of the holistic medicine and kind of believes that uh, integration of the various uh, pathies of medicine, allopathy, Ayurveda, and others uh, should certainly be looked upon and uh, should definitely help a per person or a patient to live a better and a healthy life. So with this introduction, may I welcome Dr. Kohli once again, and uh, may I request him to please start the webinar. Over to you, Dr. Kohli, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll uh, go ahead. You've already introduced about the thyroid gland. Now, before we go any further, I want to give you this, show this beautiful quotation. Uh, the thyroid gland is very important from many aspects, mm -hmm. from many points of view. And uh, it is like a very delicate flower that needs to be watered daily and meticulously cared for. If there's any problem anywhere in the body, be it because of infections, lack of nourishment, EMF exposure, stress, overload, overload of toxins, uh, this will wilt. And thereby, the physiology is going to go downhill very fast. Now, this, in a nutshell, sums up everything about the thyroid gland, that it has to be taken care of very well. Now, the first thing I would like to point out is that hypothyroidism is extremely common. And I've quoted uh, two people here, two well-known people in the field of uh, hypothyroidism. One says it is about 50% of the population. The other says it is about 80% of, of that. Of course, it varies from country to country. But the problem is that... It is very common and it is increasing day by day, which is one of the reasons why this topic has been chosen today. Now, if you'll be wondering if hypothyroidism is so common, why is it not being picked up so easily, so well? The reason for that is very simple. It is being underdiagnosed. Why that is so, you, you will obviously wonder. The reason is the diagnosis world over is generally based on one test alone, and that is the TSH. So TSH alone is what most people base their diagnosis on and treat the TSH only, high levels of TSH. And also the other reason is incorrect lab values. So here I mentioned that the usual lab value which is taken as a normal range is 0 .4, uh, 0 0.450 to 4.500. This of course varies from lab to lab. But the point I'm trying to make is that the figure on the right side is much higher than what actually should be happening. The correct range is, it should not be more than one. So if you ever see TSH more than one, a person is probably having some thyroid issue. The other reason is that the full thyroid panel is not done. So one cannot get, get a proper information about what actually is happening. The thyroid gland derives its name from the word shield from the Greek word shield, as the gland looked like the shield the Greeks used to use once upon a time. If you look at the thyroid from the uh, yogic perspective, it is related to the Vishuddhi or the throat chakra. So as you know, the throat chakra is related to space, to truth, 
साउंड एंड शुद्धता शुद्धता मीन्स प्योरिटी एंड ऑल्सो कम्युनिकेशन सो वेन एवर दिस दिस चक्रा गोज आउट ऑफ बैलेंस यू विल हैव थायरोड और पैराथायरोड इश्यूज एंड दिस जनरली हैपन्स बिकॉज ऑफ नॉट स्पीकिंग अप सप्रेसिंग योर इमोशंस being untruthful all of these factors imbalance this chakra thereby bringing about an imbalance in the functioning of the thyroid gland also so the thyroid is a very important organ it affects virtually every cell every organ every gland in the body therefore it is involved in regulation of metabolism digestion heartbeat muscle control neurological things all of these so all cells in the body have receptor sites for thyroid hormones there are two things for which every cell in the body has receptor sites one is the thyroid the other is vitamin d which of course we are not discussing today so it affects everything our entire physiology is dependent on that now this is something which everybody knows how the thyroid gland is produced we need to start with the trh trh from the thyroid from the hypothalamus which stimulates the pituitary to produce tsh and this tsh acts on the thyroid gland to produce the thyroid hormones this is a basic physiology which everybody is aware of and uh, thyroid hormones are formed by the attachment of iodine to a protein called tyrosine this is how it all happens and thyroid cells are the only cells in the body that can absorb iodine we will be discussing iodine uh, in some detail also now uh, what happens is that when the tsh is acted upon by enzyme tpo it is then that t4 t3 t2 and t1 there are seven types of thyroid hormones starting from t4 to t1 i'm sorry about it i don't know why the arrows have got misplaced but let's live with it so the tsh produces t4 and t3 we'll discuss this in a little more detail now what happens is that a very large amount of tsh is produced and this sorry sorry uh, tsh produces the uh, least production of t4 large amount of t4 is produced and this t4 then needs to be converted to t3 remember one thing a very basic fact t4 itself is inactive it cannot enter the cell it is only when t4 is converted into t3 that uh, action of the thyroid hormones actually starts because of that so when the body needs uh, thyroid hormones then 80% t4 gets converted to t3 in the liver and 20% in the gi tract by the friendly bacteria present there now unfortunately at this point of time there are very few people who have a healthy liver or they have a healthy gut so digestion all over the world has been affected for various reasons we are not going to discuss that today but remember that because the liver and the gi tract are not functioning as they ought to be functioning so there is bound to be an improper conversion of t4 to t3 that means the active t3 hormone is deficient in most of us and this conversion takes place because of enzyme known as dehydrogenase enzyme which i'm going to discuss subsequently but this point is very important t4 to t3 conversion is increased by iodine vitamins a b12 b2 b6 selenium iron and zinc so these are very very important factors which are never taken into consideration when you are treating a thyroid patient especially iodine iodine the bulk of the people in the world including india are deficient in id so that is another factor which needs to be considered now what happens is that when the t4 gets converted into t3 a certain amount of it gets converted into something which is known as rt3 or reverse t3 so then liver normally produces some rt3 when it is in the process of converting t4 to t3 now the, the important point about rt3 or reverse t3 is that this is basically an energy saving energy saving uh, action which takes place in the body and this is an anti thyroid uh, anti t3 hormone that is it stops the function of t3 so as i told you that t4 converts to t3 and t3 is the effective hormone but when rt3 is produced then this stops the function of t3 now more rt3 is produced because of many factors and i must mention them all abnormal cortisol like stress adrenal fatigue t4 medication like l-toxin and thyronorm so now this is something everybody is familiar with when you continuously keep using l-toxin and thyronorm for patients then uh, a certain a large amount of the t4 gets converted into rt3 which is harmful to the patient deficiency of vitamin d iodine 
high anti TPO antibodies, ferritin deficiency, acute illnesses, or estrogen dominance. But at this point, I would also like to point out that there are some physiological reasons also when RT3 is produced. And this RTP, as I mentioned, the small amount which is produced, or sometimes it may rise also for physiological reasons. This is important because, as I mentioned, this RT3 preserves energy. So slight increase may occur because of fasting or when one is recovering from strokes, or any injury, overtraining, that is overexercising, any illness or weight loss. So in any of these conditions, there may be a slight increase of RT3 which is not harmful, which is physiological. But other than that, production of RT3 is abnormal. I mentioned about the deiodinases enzymes. There are three types of them. D1 helps in the conversion of T4 to T3 in the bloodstream. D2 does so at the cellular level. And D3 is the one which brings about the production of RT3. So we don't want this to happen. We want these two to be continuously happening. They are important. So again, the basic point, T4 is inactive and needs to be converted into T3, which is the active hormone. Unfortunately, uh, in mainstream medicine, this T3 aspect is not considered. They focus only on T4, which is the reason why most patients do not improve on that treatment. Now coming to iodine. Now when you talk of T4 and T3, it means that T4 contains four atoms of iodine and T3 contains three atoms. So without sufficient iodine supply, the thyroid cannot make thyroid hormones in the proper amount. And the thyroid has developed a specialized system to concentrate more iodine into the, in the thyroid, and this is called a sodium iodide symporter. I'll come to this a little later. Now, I've already mentioned T4 to T3 conversion takes place in the liver and the gut. This is just a pictorial representation. Now, there are many other nutrients and vitamins which play a very important role in T4 to T3 conversion. I must mention about refined salt because a lot of people think that refined salt is iodized salt and therefore that would be enough for a person's iodine intake. This is far from the truth. Now, refined salt lacks necessary trace minerals, affects the adrenal glands adversely, which further hampers T4 to T3 conversion. So if you Continue taking refined salt, you are actually hampering conversion of T4 to T3, which is the active hormone. And in this instance, unrefined salt is helpful in T4 to T3 conversion because it contains all the trace minerals. So please remember this. Refined salt is bad for the thyroid gland. Coming to iodine in, in a little more detail, I must mention about this. There's a condition called iodophobia in mainstream medicine. People, most doctors anywhere in the world, are somehow afraid of this, this molecule, iodine. So there are a lot of misconceptions. And I'm quoting Dr. Guy Abrahams. He's the first person in the world to have brought attention to this condition. Of all the elements known so far, essential for human health, iodine is the most misunderstood and the most feared. Yet iodine is the safest of all the essential trace elements, being the only one that can be administered safely for long periods of time. Now, iodine, once upon a time, say about 100, 100 years back or so, were known as the universal medicine because it was used to treat a host of diseases, going from goiters to atherosclerosis, uterine fibroids, syphilis, mercury poisoning, lead poisoning, arsenic poisoning, prostatic enlargement, breast problems, ovarian cysts, eczema, depression, malaria, tonsillitis, you just name it. There are so many conditions it was used for and was quite effective. So iodine, the notion that refined iodized salt is sufficient is the, is the most dangerous misconception of, about iodine as mentioned in the iodine crisis by this lady, Lynn Farrow. So I want to repeat this. People think refined salt gives us enough iodine. This is not true. I will not go into detail just now about that. If there are any questions, I will answer that. The iodine in salt is actually iodide and not iodine. Only 10% gets absorbed after ingestion. We need both iodine and iodide. Now, the iodized salt can prevent goiter formation, but it is inadequate for the functioning of the other organs in the body. Iodine, as I mentioned, is important for all systems in the body. I'm coming to that. So iodine deficiency is far more common than is believed. 
and every cell in the body needs iodine for its metabolism. So what does it do? You must be wondering. It is necessary for not only production of thyroid hormones, but also all hormones in the body. Remember, all the hormones that are produced in the body are dependent on iodine. It is important for proper functioning of the immune system. It is also mucolytic and elevates pH. Now, at this point of time in the world, everywhere, uh, we are becoming more and more acidic because of the type of food which we are eating. So when you take iodine, it tends to take you towards an, an alkaline pH, which is very helpful for you. Iodine is a potent antibacterial, antiparasitic, antiviral, and also an anti-cancer. Uh, it has anti-cancer properties. It is effective in treating fibrocystic breast disease and ovarian disease, as well as fibroids. So it has a lot of many things to, uh, uh, it has a role in many things. So the thyroid contains the most, saliva, most iodine, uh, salivary glands also uh, contain iodine, cerebrospinal fluid in the brain, iodine is present in the substantia nigra, which is the area associated with Parkinson's disease, so iodine deficiency can lead to Parkinson's disease as well. It is present in the stomach, breasts, ovaries, ciliary body of the eye, choroid plexus, pancreas. So you see that iodine is important for every system in the body. Now, how is this iodine and iodine distributed? Iodine is picked up by the breast, the prostate, and the stomach. So if you have iodine deficiency, you may have problems with any of these, these systems. Iodide is present in the thyroid, salivary glands, and the skin. So as you can see, iodine and iodide both are important and both need to be given at the same time. Therefore, T4 contains four atoms of iodine. Without sufficient iodine supply, the thyroid cannot make adequate hormones. So this is just a repetition, so I'm not going to going in that. I mentioned about the sodium iodide symporter, which is a process which the, the thyroid has sort of generated on its own to extract iodine into the thing. So all of these organs are dependent on this NIS symporter, as well as some of them are dependent on another one, one is pendrin. I will not go into details about that, that is more technical. So what happens if there's, there's not adequate iodine in the body? You can have a lot of problems, like a large tongue, allergies, brain fog, dryness, fatigue, cysts, nodules, thyroid, ovarian problems, menstrual irregularities, feeling cold, puffiness under the eyes, hair loss, thinning of hair, depression, arrhythmias, breast, cysts, prostate enlargement, fibroids, psoriasis, there, there's a big list, and this also is only a partial list. So almost anything can happen if you're iodine deficient, which we are not considering. Now here I'm going to tell you about the serious problems which can occur because of iodine deficiency. You are aware of cretinism, we know that. It can lead to mental impairment, reduced intellectual ability, it can lead to goiter formation, infertility, predisposes to breast cancer, ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, prostate cancer. So iodine deficiency plays a very important role in these cancers. Sudden, I'm sorry, sudden infant death syndrome, multiple sclerosis, myelin disorders, ADHD. So there are many more diseases which can occur because of iodine deficiency. I'm purposely talking about that because iodine is a very, very important molecule. It is not considered in, in thyroid treatments. It is not being administered. Nobody is thinking about it. So how do you know that you're deficient in iodine? There are two ways of finding out. The best test and the most diagnostic is the 24-hour iodine loading test. Unfortunately, it is not done anywhere in, in our country, in India. It is done elsewhere, but not in India. This is a very unfortunate thing. I, I've tried very hard to find it, but I have not come to any proper uh, conclusion regarding that. So there's a very uh, there's, there's another test, which is the home iodine test, where you, you take Lugol's iodine, you paint a two-inch square of it on the inner arm. Actually, it should be here. You paint that. And this brown color of the iodine should disappear in 24 hours if your iodine levels are adequate in the body. But this does not happen. Generally, because most of us are deficient, this patch, this brown color will disappear in the next in the in the few in, in few hours only. So this is one way of finding out, but this is not diagnostic, this is not 100 percent accurate because 20 percent of iodine is accum accumulates in the skin only. So when you're deficient in, in skin, iodine deficient in skin, then you may have that. One another, another way of finding out is that if there's iodine deficiency in the skin, then one does not sweat no matter how hard one exercises or anything like that. That can be a pointer to you. Another important thing is uh, uh, among the nutrients, uh, uh, among the trace elements is selenium. Selenium is not produced by the body. Selenium is extremely important with thyroid functioning and both iodine and selenium need to be given together. 
Selenium, again, uh, we don't have any labs to test it in our country, unfortunately. But they say that if you take two Brazil nuts in a day, that should give you enough selenium. So that is one. We get uh, Brazil nuts now in our country. Magnesium is also very important for production of both T4 and also for converting T4 into T3. And there are many deficiency states. These are the uh, things in which magnesium is present. I must tell you that we are, most of us are magnesium deficient for various reasons, mostly dietary reasons, because the diet intake is not proper. So we are magnesium deficient and we need to replace magnesium. Unfortunately, the blood test which you do for magnesium is not accurate. And the RBC cell test for magnesium is what, I'm not sure whether any labs are doing that, but that is what gives you a better idea. Then zinc is another important thing which for the for uh, conversion of T4 into T3. Again, a lot of us are deficient in zinc. So we need to consider that. Again, blood levels of zinc do not give us a very correct diagnosis. So we have to do it clinically, which you can do if a person has brittle nails, if there are ridges on the nails, or if there are white spots on the nails. So these can be a pointer. And also, prostatic enlargement is supposed to be because of the deficiency of both iodine and zinc. Iron also plays a very important role in converting T4 into T3. So whenever you are testing any patient for a thyroid issue, always do an iron test. But sometimes iron alone may not give you the correct information. So you should do proper iron studies. And if iron is deficient, it is better to give a nanotized form of iodine to the patient. Vitamin B12, here I'm quoting uh, this lady, 40% hypothyroid patients have demonstrated deficiency of vitamin B12. So these vitamins are playing a very important role. Unfortunately, we do not take that into cognizance and we keep missing and not treating our patient very well. So T4 to T3 conversion is hampered by, I, there's a big list out here, aging, stress, sleep deprivation, lack of exercise, obesity, alcohol, smoking, heavy metals accumulation, which is very common, pesticides. We are exposed to pesticides every day now. Chemotherapy, radiation, medication, surgery, nutrition deficiency, I've already mentioned that. Low testosterone, testosterone, kidney liver diseases, all the will lead to inflammation, which is responsible for improper conversion of T4 to T3. This is all common sense, basically. Now, when these hormones are produced, they need to be transported uh, in, the, in the system. So this takes place through the bloodstream by thyroid binding protein, which are called TBGs. So 99% of thyroid hormones are bound. So if there's too much of binding, uh, bound, too much of bound hormones, they cause active thyroid hormones to become low. So if the binding is too much, you, what you need are free hormones. That is, you need free FT4 and free FT3, which is important for functioning. So just because they're present in the bloodstream does not mean anything. You have to have a free level, which is important. A reduced transport of T4 into T3 is seen in many conditions. Insulin resistance, diabetes and depression, anxiety, stress, bipolar disorders, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. There's so many conditions here. Now, this is important. The T3 in the pituitary often remains unaffected as it has different transporters from other tissues. It maintains its intracellular level of T3, so it remains unaffected by low T3 levels in the body. So please remember that, that the, the, at the pituitary level, this does not register, but in the blood level, it will show these things. Now, adrenals, stress, and thyroid, these all work together. So whenever there's adrenal problems or stress, thyroid always gets affected. So in any hypothyroid patient, you must look, look around for adren adrenal stress and treat them, which is extremely important for hypothyroidism. Now, inflammation, as we know, disturbs thyroid function. There are various mechanisms by which it happens. Uh, well, I'll just skip that, but just remember that inflammation is bad for the thyroid gland. Now here, uh, I would like to point out that if you look at it from the Ayurvedic perspective, thyroid issues are predominantly a vata imbalance, so hypothyroidism is vata and cuff, but of course you have to take care of pitta as well because if the fire is not properly burning, nothing is going to happen in the body. Now there are many symptoms of hypothyroidism. One is subclinical hypothyroidism, which is almost always missed unless you are very careful. And this is diagnosed when you have abnormal TSH, but there are no symptoms related to, to hypothyroidism. So symptoms can be many. Tiredness, sluggishness, lethargy, sleep, sleeping more than normal, 
constant feeling of cold, fingers, hands, feet, slower thinking, that's a brain fog, constipation, muscle joint pain, puffy hands, heavy menses, clotting, irregular menses, weaker muscles, muscle cramps, depression, mood changes, puffy eyes, hair loss, brittle hair, low sex drive, unsteady gait, thinning of outer third of eyebrows. So there are so many things which need to be considered. What generally happens is that when a patient is being treated in, uh, for hypothyroidism, the drug normally started as l or thyronorm, which is T4, which is not getting converted into T3. The symptoms persist. The TSH starts coming down. So, so the doctors think that uh, since the TSH is coming down in the normal range, therefore, they've been cured of hypothyroidism. Nothing can be further from the truth because the symptoms keep persisting. So hypothyroidism is basically everything slowing down in the body and hypothyroidism, everything uh, working faster. Now, what happens if, if one patient is a patient misdiagnosed or not treated properly? There's increased cardiovascular risk. I'll discuss this in more detail later. Coronary artery disease, endothelial damage, hypertension, peripheral vascular disease, increased coagulability, increased serum lipids. So whenever you see a patient who has ser increased serum lipids, you must always check the thyroid. Also, remember this. In the heart muscle, there is no deiodinase enzyme, and therefore the heart cannot make T3 at the cellular level. I mentioned to you that T3 is the active hormone, but the heart cannot make it. So this is one of the reasons why the heart suffers. Now I'm going to quote the gentleman, Dr. Brownstein, who has done pioneering work and has more than 30 years of experience treating thyroid patients. He's done a lot of work on iodine, salt, etc. Now he quotes a study of 35 years duration where 55, more than 55,000 patients were studied. And what they found is eye-opening. When they correlated uh, subclinical hypothyroidism, so-called subclinical, there are no symptoms, but you find that TSA levels are high. So when they found when the TSA level of between 4.5 to 6.9, the mortality increased by 9%. Mortality due to heart disease. If the TSA was between 7 to 9.9, .9, there's a 17% increase in uh, uh, coronary artery disease and 42% increase in mortality. When the TSH was between 10 to 19.9, .9, there was an 89% increase in uh, coronary artery disease and 58% increase in mortality from heart disease. So please remember, subclinical hypothyroidism is important. It should not be neglected. It should be looked into very seriously and carefully. Now, another point which Dr. Bronstein makes is that TSH is expressed on coronary arteries and the adipocytes. So elevated TSH may directly affect endothelial function of the coronary arteries. And this can induce ischemic changes in a hypothyroid patient. So because of hypothyroidism or even subclinical hypothyroidism, risk of diabetes and obesity increases because insulin resistance occurs. I've already mentioned that. Leaky gut can occur. Hashimoto's disease can occur, which we cannot discuss today. Then there can be neuropsychological problems, increased risk of Parkinson's disease. Hearing loss, carpal tunnel syndrome, polymyositis-like syndrome, weakness, stiffness, Alzheimer's disease. So almost anything can happen. There can be complications during pregnancy. There can be male reproductive issues, all because of thyroid problems. So what can we see if it is not picked up or not diagnosed or not treated properly? So if you have hypothyroidism, you have not treated it properly. So what can happen? So the manifestation could be neurological, like headaches, paresthesias, carpal tunnel syndrome, vertigo, tinnitus. So remember, tinnitus is a, uh, can occur because of hypothyroidism as well. Cognitive deficit, deficits, calculation problem, memory, reduced attention span, sleep apnea, mixed edema, coma, psychiatric syndromes, depression, psychosis, bipolar disorders, arthralgias, uh, polymyalgia. So many conditions can take place. So how do you diagnose hypothyroidism? This is a very important point. Now here I want to take you back to some 40, 50 years back or even earlier than that. Uh, the clinical diagnosis of hypothyroidism. This is important and I think this should be a, a take home message for everybody because uh, this, you know, you can get a very good idea of hypothyroidism um, uh, by doing it at home only. This is the clinical thing, waking up an underarm temperature which are devised by Dr. Broda Barnes. Now, in this, what is done is that with a mercury or liquid thermometer, take your temperature under your arm for 
10 minutes before rising out of bed in the morning. Before getting up out of bed, you measure the temperature on four consecutive days. But don't do it if you have an infection, injury, or any condition which can produce mild fever. Some have modified it by using the oral electrical thermometer. Now, the important point is that if you, if by this method, if you find that the temperature between 97.8 to 98.2, you probably do not have hypothyroidism. But if it is 97.8 or less, then you probably have hypothyroidism. This is a very good test and can be advised for almost every patient. It is important. Now, that of the diagnostic, the usual tests which are done at all over the world, I'm seeing it happening in the US also. They do only either, either TSH alone or just total T3, total T4 and TSH. That's it. Nothing more is done. While uh, what happens because of this is that if you do only TSH, then one, it is unreliable. It is more of a screening test. Lab ranges I've already mentioned. The lab ranges which are given in the labs are incorrect. They're inaccurate. I mentioned earlier that if anything more than one is taking, is if, if the TSA level is more than one, it means that it is abnormal. So conventional medicine only starts treatment when the TSA level goes beyond 10. This is very unfortunate. So what happens is for a very long time, patients who were subclinical or had no symptoms start developing symptoms, the thyroid starts malfunctioning, and then treatment starts, and then also the treatment is not, not correct. So the, of the lab values, uh, you what you need to do is when you do the testing, remember that of the free T3, that when you do the T3 test, then the T3 should be uh, close to the upper limit of normal. So if it is not close to the upper limit of normal, then it is abnormal. T3 has to be more. So the correct thyroid blood test should be total T3, T4, TSH, free T3, T4, which is more important, and RT3. Again, unfortunately, RT3 is very difficult to do in our country. I know, so far, I know that Delhi, only La Lab does it, but they send the sample abroad and the report comes after three to four weeks. So it is not very practicable. Then every patient should have thyroid antibodies done, especially now in, in view of uh, uh, what has been happening because of COVID and also because of the vaccine which people have been getting. So a lot of patients have been have started getting high levels of antibody, which means they are they are becoming autoimmune. So every patient have a total T3, T4, TSH, free T3, T4, RT3, if it is possible, or thyroid and, and thyroid antibodies. Now, early morning cortisol levels should also be checked as a practical method, because if uh, cortisol levels are abnormal, then you got to treat that. As I mentioned uh, earlier, adrenal and thyroid go hand to hand, so that also needs, needs to be considered. Now, this I'm giving you a very rough idea of, an, of getting an idea of the RT3. Now, if a person has a lot of anxiety and you find that the total T4 is very high, as in this particular situation, and you find that the FT4 is very low, so there's a marked difference between this total T4 and also the TSH is high. So if there's a high TSH, there's a marked rise in total T4 and very low free T4, that means that a lot of it is getting converted into RT3. This particular person also had an RT3 test done. So this was done in the US. So we could do the RT3 test and he found it was 27.6. The normal range is 5 to 25, but anything beyond 15 is taken to be abnormal. So if you see a total T4 being high, FT4 being very low and high TSH values, you can suspect presence of RT3. And RT3 has to be treated because if you do not treat it by giving T3 to the patient. There can be very serious complications. Now, uh, this person, Dr. Richard uh, Bayless, uh, told us that uh, only 18% of thyroid hormones can be found in the blood. 75% are found in muscle, skin, and brain. And because of this, he feels the neurotransmitter function of the body is very important. And on this was based this new test, which is known as the Thyroflex test. The thyroid test has been devised by uh, Dr. Turner uh, in the US. And uh, this has two parts. One, it has a very detailed questionnaire and a scoring system, where here you have all the symptoms of hypothyroidism, symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Then the stress modulators like DHEA, Bs, vitamin D, uh, GABA, etc. Uh, through this questionnaire, you get an idea what how the adrenal glands are functioning what the iodine levels are, iodine uh, deficiency is there or not. 
what is happening to melatonin in the body, etc. So this is a very detailed questionnaire. It gives us a very good idea of what is happening in the body, and you can give the appropriate supplements. The actual test is this. It looks like this. So what happens is that this bar should be in the in the green range. When it is in the green range, it means there is no hypothyroidism. If it is in these two ranges, then the person can get away with just uh, supplemental support, and this shows the resting metabolic rate. So in this particular patient, you find that it, this is in the green range, so there, there is no hypothyroidism. So this person is quite all right. While in this particular case, it is in the orange range. So this patient was given only supplements, and he improved. This is another patient who has high levels. He has classical hypothyroidism, and uh, they of course need bioidentical hormones for and the correction of deficiencies. So the thyroflex test has very uh, it has the advantage of being very sophisticated and very accurate. Disadvantage is that it is expensive and needs a well-trained technician, which is hard to come by, not easily available everywhere, and needs to be done pretty often. So overall, it becomes quite expensive. So therefore, we have to find a practical solution. So the management depends on the stage of the disease and the results on the thyroflex. So the very first thing which we need to do for all patients is we need to balance vata, and everybody I think knows it: regular routine, regular sleep. Sleep wake pattern, regular meal time, sleep at 10 p.m., get up early, eat warm cooked food, avoid cold salads, raw foods, as you know, that cold and salads and raw foods, etc., aggravate vata. Do not rest through the day. Most patients, if you see hypothyroid patients, especially if they are tending towards uh, autoimmunity, you find that they, they are fond of talking, they are fond of wasting their energy. Gentle exercise like yoga, walking, tai chi, stretching, etc., are important. And unctuous diet, especially ghee, or the healthy fats are important for them. Oil massage, go outside in the, the elements of the earth and water, antidote to vata, walk barefoot on grass, etc. Now, this, this is applicable for all patients of hypothyroidism. All of them should be advised that. Then, use of ghee, I've already mentioned. Ghee has many, many advantages. I don't need to spell it out. I think I'll just rush through because uh, then, of course, if you're early subclinical hypothyroidism, General detoxification procedures are very important. Uh, Ayurveda does an excellent job of it, like vaman, mud packs, kunjal, dry brushing, far infrared. Far infrared is what we do a lot. I advise a patient dry brushing, and any of these can be advised. You must detoxify the gut. That is very important. Liver detoxification, improve bile flow. Now, I want to mention here that hypothyroidism can occur also because of liver disease or liver problems, and also because of improper bile flow, and vice versa is also true. So any hypothyroid patient must have an attention, your, you must attend to the liver and the gallbladder. It is very important because bile sludge or gallstones are very common in these patients. So unless and until you correct this, you will not be able to correct the, the hypothyroid problem properly. So detoxification is extremely important. Without effectively treating the liver and gut flora, it is nearly impossible to treat any weakness of the thyroid gland, whether it is hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now, in this, I would like to mention, I had a detailed discussion with Dr. Vikrant Patil, who has been treating uh, thyroid exclusively for the past, uh, I think, 17 to 18 years. And uh, he has had excellent results. And as per him, Vaman is very effective. When proper detoxification is done, more than half of the thyroid symptoms regress. So Vaman itself helps in regression of the vast majority of the symptoms. And a, a very large number of patients can have the disease reversed. We'll come to this a little later also. Yoga plays a very important role in uh, hypothyroidism, especially Bhujangasana, Setubandasana, Halasana, Vipreet Karni, Sarvangasana, Singhasana. Ujjayi pranayam, brahmari, and alom vilom pranayam are very important. These two uh, mudras are also very good for hypothyroid patients. Meditating on the Vishuddhi chakra, but then, of course, one can meditate on the Vishuddhi chakra, the Manipur chakra, and the Anaha chakra as well. Yoga, nidra, and meditation. So, this should be part and parcel of every patient who is being treated for this thing. Now, this is the Shank mudra. Now, it is said that if you if you sit in this posture for about 20 to 25 minutes daily, it helps in uh, your uh, thyroid functioning. 
and there's the sahaj shank mudra which is also very good ujjayi pranaya we all know is very effective because it acts uh, at the vishuddhi chakra brahmi pranaya again is is good now these supplements are very important so when you are testing a patient for uh, for hypothyroidism or whatever type of uh, thyroid problem they should always be checked for these deficiencies now as i mentioned iodine deficiency we can only have a rough idea but symptoms give us a, a lot of information so iodine should be part and parcel of uh, every patient of hypothyroidism and the dose which i normally give is 5 mg now this can come in the form of a tablet which is not very easy to procure in india but it can be imported but the easiest way to get it is to, to take lugol's iodine lugol's iodine can, comes in two strengths 2% or 5% if it is 5% then you use only two drops in a glass of water daily if it is 2% use five drops and supplement selenium selenium either you can give selenium methionine which is available in our country or brazil nuts now a lot of our patients are deficient in vitamin d3 so vitamin d must always be checked and you will you will find it to be deficient you supplement vitamin d3 along with k2 mk7 because other than otherwise if this is not given then d3 may not be that effective as i already mentioned 40% of hypothyroid patients have b12 deficiency so correct that and for the b12 you can check b12 directly in the blood in addition you must always check for uh, ferritin you must also check for homocysteine because homocysteine if it is rising it indicates the deficiency of b12 and other b vitamins zinc deficiency you can't detect in the blood magnesium iron all that you got to see and uh, there is one way you can do that and that is by doing a scan called the oligo scan which is available with some places only not everywhere it gives us a very fair idea of the deficiencies so a lot of hypothyroid patients may have only the problem may only be deficiencies so if you correct them it is quite possible if it is early hypothyroidism or subclinical hypothyroidism initially you may have to give the thyroid hormone but you can combine these with supplements and gradually maybe wean them off so the moment you start iodine then the requirement of the hormones uh, decreases now uh, this i am purposely mentioning because the mainstay of treatment in mainstream medicine is is to give eltroxin or thyronorm and usual story is when you start eltroxin or thyronorm the tsh starts coming down it comes down that it may increase again so gradually you keep on increasing the dose of the thyroid hormone people go up to 200 to 250 micrograms of eltroxin thyronorm so what happens is that there's only just juggling around with the tsh the, if you increase the dose the tsh comes down then you reduce the dose then it increases again and this whole story goes on but people forget that the t4 is not active it has to be converted into the to the active form and for that you need something else so management of overt hypothyroidism these i already discussed detoxification supplements and all that and these are the ways thyroid uh, hypothyroidism is treated t4 i already mentioned this is the treatment which is being followed but this is uh, uh, not a very good method of treatment because it is not curing any patient at all now t3 alone cytomel is given only in the if the rt3 is very high so then you give cytomel which is available and t3 also is available in different forms then you give that for about 25 to 30 days and the rt3 comes down and then you proceed with the combination of t4 and t3 now usually the combination should be ratio of 4 is to 1 is what is given it can be 3 is to 1 also at times the preferred types of hormones are the bioidentical hormones which are t3 and t4 which can be either natural or they can be compounded now the <clears throat> the problem here is the bioidentical hormones are difficult to come by now in india you are not getting any of the natural hormones they have to be imported and they are quite expensive you have compounding pharmacies in in india which are compounding t3 and t4 but unfortunately in india these are synthetic and compounded pharmacies from abroad again they would be the drug would be expensive there is one more option however and that is you can use just like, like you're using eltroxin you can give a combination of t4 that is eltroxin or thyronorm and you get this t3 and calculate the ratio yourself so the ratio should be as i mentioned 4 is to 1 or 3 is to 1 but this is something which can be tried because this would be inexpensive so this is the almost the long and short of it but we must not forget 
that uh, Ayurveda has some very good uh, herbs. Of these, the most important is Kanchanar Gugulu. This is supposed to be very effective. Uh, so far, I put only one patient of mine on this, and I'm awaiting to see the results. But uh, uh, Dr. Patil is uh, very optimistic. He's developing something else also. And Ashwagandha, of course, is very important because it has a very good role to play on the adrenal glands. So to conclude, hypothyroidism is very common. It is important to pick it up as early as possible. It can lead to a lot of complications if not picked up on time or not treated properly. Usual blood tests are not adequate for diagnosis. Diag diagnosis is best done by a combination of blood tests and thyroflex, if thyroflex is possible. Detoxification plays a very, very important role. Supplements of iodine, selenium, magnesium, and all that I've already mentioned are important. Yoga, pranaya, meditation must never be forgotten along with exercise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Dr. Kohli, uh, for uh, throwing light on such an important topic and that too in a very uh, detailed manner. I'm very sure many of the doctors that are listening to us uh, will certainly be uh, enlightened about this uh, topic and uh, uh, must have understood in a much, much better way. Uh, on YouTube and other channels on which the uh, webinar is live, uh, there are a couple of queries, uh, Dr. Kohli. Uh, Dr. Bhupesh Vashist, he's asking, sir, what are the conditions where we find both T3 and TSH raised or abnormally raised thyroid hormones? Things. So he's asking which are the conditions that we you know typically find both T3 and TSH raised. Uh, both T3, this is uh, not very common to find because uh, uh, TSH, as I mentioned, has to be converted into T3. So uh, very unusual for it to happen that both of them are going to be raised. Uh, both of them can be lowered. Yes, of course, if the, if the TSH is markedly raised and TSH is slightly raised. I didn't mention that this T3 uh, T3 should be at the upper level of normal. So that should not be taken as high because you want a T3 as high as possible but in the normal range because that is the effective hormone. And uh, uh, sorry, I mistook uh, the, this TSH for T4. TSH would be, would be high in uh, any of the conditions where there is hypothyroidism and along with the raised T3, that is unlikely. Great. Uh, sir, uh, you also mentioned in your uh, uh, webinar that salt, you know, the table salt, which we commonly call, or an yes. iodized salt. Yeah, there's there's a lot of misconceptions, and there, you know, uh, today we find uh, black salt, rock salt, pink salt, right? So many of the doctors are asking that, how do we look it from a medical standpoint? That which one is much better, uh, you know, in terms of the medical efficacy and all. So you're, uh, from you're, you're that the point of view, actually, they have studied, there's actually a book on salt only, written by the same gentleman, Dr. Brownstein. It's an excellent book. Yeah. If you can lay your hands on that, that tells you everything about it. He has actually scientifically studied uh, Celtic salt and another salt which is available in the US. They've analyzed everything out of that. Pink Himalayan salt has also been studied, not there, but, but in India. So of all these salts which are available, of the unrefined salts, uh, the West has a different set, but pink Himalayan salt, I consider it to be very good for the simple reason that it has about uh, 84 micronutrients in addition to sodium and chloride and also contains moisture because all of these unrefined salts, they have originally come from the sea. Though pink Himalayan salt, is from uh, northern parts of uh, India and Pakistan, mainly Pakistan. And the color pink is because of the trace elements which are present there. So because this is trace element, therefore this is very, very effective. When you talk of ro uh, rock salt, rock salt, Himalayan pink salt is a type of rock salt. So it is very similar. Now, in India, we, we get that uh, the rock type of salt which you got to break and then powder it, and then, then you can use it as, uh, at home. Then you have this black salt, kala namak, you say, I'm getting. Now, kala namak is originally supposed to be volcanic ash. But uh, in Ayurveda, you've been using it in different uh, forms. You've been adding halar and certain other things to this salt for this Ayurvedic benefits. 
but the problem with black salt is that it also contains fluoride so that can be disadvantage because fluoride is very bad for the thyroid gland and bad for us as it is fluoride we should not have any fluoride in our body it is very bad for us unfortunately so the choices we have is of the unrefined salt pink salt or rock salt sendha namak is actually rock salt but you got to be very sure that the sendha namak has come from the right source but refined salt is definitely bad it should not be used period actually i did a recent webinar on salt and iodine uh, just last week so salt i will repeat unrefined salt uh, pink salt is is the best but of course you can have others you can have celtic sea salt this celtic sea salt comes from france actually and is supposed to be very good then they have some more salt in the us which uh, of course we won't have them in india but we have rock salt in india we can use that uh, sir you talked about the uh... trace elements in the in the uh, salt right and also you touched upon selenium which is also an important uh, uh, yes. you know kind of the uh, mm-hmm. trace element mm-hmm. uh, and there are various formulations if we look at today you know in the market which have uh, chromium zinc and selenium czs right which is one of the uh, uh, very good combinations you know that is used so mm-hmm. how do you look the use of trace elements you know in the particular uh, kind of a tablet or a synthetic formulation vis-a-vis from a natural source because there's a lot of you know as you mentioned sometimes that there are certain lobbies that uh, you know that are promoting in more in synthetic form which comes from the pharmaceutical companies so mm-hmm. uh, many of the doctors are asking that uh, how do we recommend it from a natural source to a patient chromium zinc and selenium uh, or well, in, there are selenium. lots of companies which are which are making uh, very good quality uh, supplements many companies are making that in fact i would be very happy if dabar starts doing that so dabar okay. has a name and if they start coming into this business i think it's going to help a lot of patients so there are a few selected companies from which you can have that but when you're using unrefined salt then a lot of those things you're already getting so that is one one okay. advantage now other than that if you if you can actually demonstrate deficiency of anything then you got to supplement that so uh, chromium is important but chromium not that important for the thyroid but chromium is important from the insulin resistance point of view alpha lipoic acid is important so you got to go for good brands and i don't want to mention any particular brand because i might be taken otherwise but there are good brands available which from which you can buy and and you can use them but you have to be uh, sure of the dosage like for example Correct. if you have to give selenium methionine then about 200 micro 200 to 400 microgram is the actual dose but you give it for a short period say about 2 3 months then stop it and then maybe periodically because selenium can have its uh, side effects also later on and other other complications but if you can have brazil nuts if it is possible just two brazil nuts a day is, is enough for every patient on the other hand if you are using zinc then again you have to be careful because prolonged use of zinc leads to copper deficiency so mm. again you have to be careful you know supplement doesn't mean that you keep on using it forever you have to be very vigilant and very careful about that same with vitamin d if you continue using vitamin d you know the optimal dose is about actually 70 to 80 not 20 to 30 as what is described in the uh, in uh, uh, mainstream medicine so there also if you using uh, vitamin d a lot you must use k2 along with that you must use magnesium along with that because magnesium and uh, d complement each other's function and then be on the lookout for its side effects also the only important side effect with with vitamin d is uh, hypercalcemia and that can happen in our country because calcium is being used very frequently great uh, sir dr vashisht is asking that most of the dietitians stops meals such as broccoli in the patients of hypothyroidism how i don't is, think how... i don't think that is important because nobody is consuming that much of broccoli and all that and if you are already taking the thyroid hormones you are taking if you are taking iodine along with that the you know nobody eating broccoli nobody eats a full broccoli every day you have Correct. some pieces of that same thing with gobi also so this is a misconception because this study which unfortunately even in mainstream medicine studies which were done some 70 80 years back they are being quoted and nobody done anything after that it's a big misconception so agree they say these are quantitative and all but nothing happens because the amount of the quantity which you eat is not going to cause any problem 
and sir uh, from a from a disease prevalence standpoint if you look at right uh, mm-hmm. women are more susceptible to hypothyroidism yes. as compared to males yes. right yes. and uh, there are also clinical data coming up showing that hypothyroidism could be a important marker for uh, developing uh, diabetes at a later stage in life right so how how does uh, you know uh, the diabetes plus hypothyroidism and the other complications uh, particularly in the female so a female doctor is asking how do we uh, look at that first from a diagnosis standpoint and second from a treatment uh, you know kind of standpoint sir uh, see i think i mentioned in the beginning that uh, uh, iodine which is the most important thing for conversion of t4 into t3 iodine sure. is important not only for the thyroid it is important for every gland in the body every hormone in the body and we are grossly deficient in iodine okay now because uh, ladies also uh, they need a lot of iodine they're not getting that iodine and i mentioned to you that the breast the prostate uterus ovaries all need iodine and if they are not getting it this is one of the important reasons why they're getting so much of diseases in fact mm. there have been studies to show that people who have been on uh, who have been hypothyroid for a long time incidence of breast cancer is very high in them incidence of prostate cancer is high in them incidence of ovarian cysts is very high in them incidence of fibroids is very high in them and this is predominantly to do with lack of iodine so if iodine has to be supplemented actually there's a big protocol for iodine how much to be given how to be given which i can discuss if if anybody wants it but lack of iodine is the main reason another point i want to make here is that if you're treating a hypothyroid patient for long but not giving iodine there have been studies to show that cancer breast has increased similarly people who have a goiter people who have a fibroid who have an ovarian cyst have fibroid no more the breast or fibroid uh, cyst in the breast if they given the right amount of iodine they all regress iodine is also known to cure skin skin problems in the sense that you have you know skin tags if you apply iodine over that these can disappear in due course of time so iodine is a very important molecule which is being missed everywhere allopaths are not prescribing it i'm not aware of any other doctors are in any other specialty but iodine has got to be given each one of my patient is getting a certain amount of iodine every day iodine iodide not iodine alone it has to be a combination because i mentioned to you that certain organs certain parts of the body pick up iodine others pick up iodide thyroid mm. requires mainly iodine and the the salt which your refined salt has only iodide in it does not have iodine so again thyroid is not getting its enough supply of iodine uh one doctor is asking sir uh, what are the typical lifestyle modifications that uh, uh, apart from medication and others uh, you know in today's life uh, fast paced life that that one could you know do to kind of counter hypothyroidism so uh, food and other things sir uh food basically the thing is that the type of food which you have to have it has to be natural which you, we talk for all diseases one you should be detoxifying yourself on a regular basis that is the first thing to happen for everybody to do and there are certain things which you can do every day at home for that one you can use uh, dry brushing at home you you should massage your body every day oil swishing thing like that exposure to the sun all these are important reduce or eliminate your exposure to chemicals to plastics uh, stop using uh, chemical uh, you know, stop using plastic uh, comb stop using uh, you know foamy type of shaving creams you know go for all organic stuff which is all available in our country that is one part of it second is the type of food which you are going to eat should be natural no refined food no packed food no packaged foods we know all about that no fast foods eat what is healthy you must have an adequate amount of healthy fat in you i have already mentioned about ghee and olive oil and coconut oil and all that so eat natural eliminate wheat from your diet eliminate sugar from your diet eliminate milk from your diet these three would be sufficient to take you a long way along with that you must exercise and also take care of your your mind by relaxation techniques meditate do yoga pranayam this is what uh, is is a full package 
But despite that, if there is any family history of hypothyroidism, then you are likely to have hypothyroidism yourself and get yourself checked. And when you get checked, do the full panel. Total T3, T4, TSH, FT3, FT4, if RT3 is possible, and the antibodies. And along with that, iron levels, vitamin B12 levels, vitamin D levels, ferritin, etc. So to see if there are any deficiencies. If you want to be very sure, you can do an oligo scan that will give an idea of the trace element deficiencies and those can be corrected. But when we are correcting the deficiency, a very important point is which most doctors miss. What is the reason for that deficiency? The reason mostly is an inadequately functioning liver and gut. Mm -hmm. So you may have a leaky gut. You correct that. So when you do that, along with supplementation in the beginning, then a stage will come and you will have adequate uh, levels of all of these. Great, great. So thank you, I think, uh, for the wonderful uh, knowledge that you have shared today with uh, almost uh, uh, all the doctors that have joined us and who will be watching also on YouTube later on. I think this is a fantastic and kind of in-depth knowledge on such a complicated topic, which is generally not that given serious thought uh, as compared to other kind of uh, diseases. So I think hypothyroidism and uh, going by the prevalence, if we look at, you know, there are recent articles saying that it is on the rise in India, right, because of the various uh, various uh, data that we have on the table. So I think this will certainly help many of the doctors to understand it in a much better way and kind of integrate uh, various uh, treatment modalities and options that we have for the betterment of the patient to live a healthy life. Uh, Dr. Kohli from the entire family of Dabur India, we'd like to thank you. We'd like thank to thank you. all the doctors that have joined us for the webinar and we look forward to you uh, continuing with us and kind of helping us, uh, you know, in uh, uh, in kind of uh, getting the patient a much quality and a better life. So with that, we'll, we have come to the end of the webinar. We'll see you next time. Till then, from all of us, from Dabur, a healthy and a happy weekend. Thank you so much. Stay healthy, stay safe. Namaskar. There's thank another you. question that just cropped up. Yeah, refined salt should not be given, but for hypothyroidism, iodine salt is necessary or not? Yeah, iodine salt, no. Iodine salt is not helping us much. Uh, well, I'll mention a little in more detail. Now, the amount of uh, iodine uh, put iodide put in the salt is 150 mcg. 150 mcg is the RDA which has been calculated world over for a body's requirement. Okay. Now, out of this 150 mcg, about 35% gets lost while cooking. And when in the, in the factory where it is packed, by the time it reaches the store, a lot of it evaporates because iodine is a gas. So that evaporates. And by the time it comes to your home, when you open it, there's more iodine in the kitchen air than it is in the, in the salt. So ultimately, just about 10% of it is going into you. And also, this is chemical which is not going to help you much. Therefore, ID needs to be supplemented. But yes, I can say it may be better than nothing, but refined salt has many other disadvantages. Refined salt can lead to so many other diseases by itself. So why go in for refined salt? You take unrefined salt and supplement your iodine. Iodine iodide. That is going to be better than anything else. There's one more question, sir, that can change of mindset eventually result in controlling hypothyroidism from an emotional level? Absolutely. Emotion play a very important role. And if you remember my first slide, the thyroid is like okay. a flower. So the, any flower needs to be handled very carefully and gently. So emotions also damage it. And therefore, again, the role of meditation and yoga and pranayama, that is very important. Every emotion, uh, let, let me point out, there is a difference between feeling and emotion. Feeling mm. is something purer than that. Emotion is a disturbance. It is like when you throw a stone in, in the water. The water has been still before. The moment you throw the stone, the ripple is forming. And there's a disturbance. So the disturbance is going to disturb all your systems, especially the thyroid gland. Therefore, you've got to look after it very well. You have to be positive and visualization. I have not mentioned about visualization today, but that plays a very important role also. Great, great. So... Sir, please give details on how to use iodine in which form? Again, one more question. Okay. I didn't mention that. Iodine, which is easily available in India, is in the form of Lugol's iodine. Lugol was a gentleman who devised it in the, I think, 1700, 1800 or something like that. It's the first uh, known 
the time of Napoleon, because then it was used for you know people who were dying, getting injured in battle and all that. So Dr. Lugol devised it. The same formula is still being used everywhere, and this has both potassium iodide as well as iodine, and this comes in five percent bottle as well as two percent bottles. When you're using a five percent bottle, then you take two drops of it in a glass of water, and take it in the morning. Now. If you are taking it with a thyroid medication, then the thyroid medication should be taken early in the morning. Nothing for forty-five minutes after that. So iodine normally can be taken just before your breakfast. Uh, take it in a glass of water. If you are using two percent uh, Lugol's iodine, then take uh, five drops. If it is five percent, take two drops. Now a very important point is that when you when you use iodine, then iodine detoxifies your body. And these halides, iodides, bromides, chlorides, and fluorides. Now, of the bromides and fluorides, they they compete against iodine. So, what happens is the when the iodine starts going into your body, you start getting a a detoxifying reaction, Hiroshima reaction, which happens with any detoxification. Because of that, bromide starts getting excreted out. So, initially, at least in India, I have not noticed any patient to have that at the dose which we are prescribing, which I have already mentioned here. But if you have to increase the dose of iodine, then it is better to give the patient, ask the patient to have half a teaspoonful of unrefined salt in a glass of water twice a day for about two weeks, along with magnesium, if it is possible, and some vitamin C also. So that way you detoxify the patient beforehand. So that is a way to keep increasing the iodine dose. Now people have been taking 25 milligram of iodine. If you're taking 50 milligram, even up to 100 milligram, depends on the type of condition which you have. So, if you have a fibroid, if you have an ovarian cyst, you can actually reverse it by increasing dose of iodine. Now, that I don't know to discuss that in detail just now, but if somebody wants to know, I can give them the protocol of how that needs to be done. Because iodine, uh, taking iodine is a very specialized sort of a thing. It has to be well understood and not just be, to be taken like that. The person who is advising you should be able to guide you properly. What can be the side effects, and what there are no side effects as such of iodine. The side effects occur because of the other things in the body, which are trying to come out. Iodine itself is very, is is very good for you, and when you start taking iodine, then the dose of your thyroid medication starts decreasing. So iodine starts improving the function of the thyroid gland, so you don't don't require too much too high a dose of thyroid medications. So if somebody Great. wants to know, they can write to me on email, and I'll I'll be very happy to explain to them. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. So, if there are any uh, questions pertaining to the formulation of iodine, the protocol, and all that, we'll definitely kind of uh, reach out yeah. to you and share the information with the uh, concerned doctors. So, with that, doctor, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.